Uh, thank you very much, Marcy, and uh, a good morning from the central coast of California and a good afternoon to parts that are east of here. And this afternoon or this morning, we'll be going through a panelized wood roof system and how it needs to be designed for a seismic design with heavy walls typically, as is quite often done. This is a very common type of framing system that's been done along the seismically active west and is becoming more and more popular towards the east coast. What I'd like to do today is give you a presentation that is copyrighted. Uh, just realize that the presentation and distribution and uh, reproduction is, is copyrighted material and it needs permission if it's going to be used outside of this educational purpose today. Also, today's presentation uh, can be uh, used to earn credits with AIA as well as the course description that is the beginning of this presentation that is on a copy of the slides can be used to refer back to to see a summary of what today's presentation will be. The outline and the objectives really is upon completion of today you'll be able to identify the characteristics of a panelized wood roof diaphragm and apply those to a wall anchorage system which the forces are very unique for this type of uh, system that we need to uh, really have a critical approach to investigating since that's where most of the damages occur after earthquakes or during earthquakes. The distribution of these forces into the diaphragm will be one of the objectives that we need to pay attention to. As well as after today you'll be able to learn how to utilize sub-diaphragms as a tool to create an efficient load path in for the wall anchorage system. Also finally, the design of wood diaphragms and their cords and the collectors for seismic forces will be something that you'll be able to do much better after today. So we're going to start off with the first polling question as always and Marcy, why don't you go ahead and take it. Alright, here we go. Um, let me. What is your profession? Um, let me launch that, sorry. All right, so go ahead and start voting. Are you an architect, engineer, code official, building designer, or other? I'm going to give you probably only about 30 seconds on this one because this doesn't require a whole lot of thought. So far, we have mostly engineers. All right. 83% of you have voted, and I am going to close the poll. And sharing the poll. 83% engineers, 10% code officials, 4% architects, and 2% other. No building designers today. But welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. All right, and it should be back to you, John. All right. Well, very good. Thanks. And uh, I will certainly coordinate uh, that with my uh, presentation to make sure that I am hitting the right target audience here. First of all, large wood roof diaphragms, uh, I will be covering really what the panelized roof structure is all about and how it was developed and what makes it unique from a regular system of uh, diaphragm structure that's more conventional. Also, I'll be talking about the wall anchorage system, which is very important for these buildings and has been a source of concern in the past. We'll also look at the main roof diaphragm as the loads develop deep into the diaphragm, how the main roof diaphragm will behave. And we'll also be addressing the diaphragm deformation that occurs in these buildings. First of all, a panelized roof structure is composed of Typically, this is a sort of an older style uh, that is um, all wood system with uh, possibly wood columns uh, or steel columns. Uh, we have two by um, four subperlins or stiffeners that are supporting the OSB roof or in, in this case or some can be a plywood roof system as well. And those stiffeners or subperlins are attached to the purlins. And the purlins then will be spanning between the girders. And the girders, as you see, sort of the girder in the lower part of the slide has a cantilever out to a hinge for an efficient balance of the positive and negative bending moment. And this is how the system really began, especially in, uh, it was born in California as an efficient way of installing a large roof structure in a very quick and timely means with uh, much better safety. <clears throat> 
And as you see here, it's a forklift that is putting up a panel, in a sense, a panelized structure or modular structure, in a sense, is what we have here. And it is composed of these two by four, or I'm sorry, these four by eight sheets of plywood or OSB are oriented really in the opposite direction than we would normally see. It actually has its strength axis parallel to the supports, which is different than what we normally see where it is in a weaker situation. However, the advantage of this is it provides full blocking around the perimeter by lining up with the subperlins and the perlins to give us nice high diaphragm values. It allows us to modular install the entire bay that is 8 foot wide and 40, 50, 60 feet long as a single element. And that efficiency has made this very, very popular. In fact, in order to do this, it, the, the hangers for the subperlins are actually already installed on the subperlin when they're in, erected in, in place. So here's a typical hanger that would be on a subperlin, and it's installed onto the subperlin prior to being erected onto the perlin. So it's sort of a, a backwards type of erection sequence. And the nail holes that are in that subperlin hanger are going to be essentially hidden. And so the nailer is actually going to be nailing that hanger blind in a sense. However, the tested values of these and the proved values of these permit the nails to miss those holes and actually penetrate the sheet metal themselves. And in today's um, compressed air nail guns, that's not a problem at all. The, the nails will certainly penetrate through that. And that's how the system has been developed. And it's a very, very efficient system. So you can see here that we actually have the hangers already attached to the ends of our subperlins. Uh, and the forklift is going to place that up onto the roof and then marry it and mate it up against the existing perlin that's in place. In this type of system, uh, here's an all wood system. It can be uh, visually very attractive. This is a system that was done for the Carpenters Union in Ontario, and they've since used this in a number of places. But what's really unique about what you see here, besides being an all wood system with some nice glue lambs that were of architectural grade, is this is a heavy timber roof. It's actually using inch and eighth plywood with uh, purlins and sub purlins and glue lambs that comply to the fire resistive requirements for heavy timber. This is a very unique application that you see here, but it just shows the variety that can be done with this type of system. And uh, here's a, a, another photo of the same system that was used. And it's sort of a craftsman style look, but this is a, a unique application for this. The all wood systems are actually still somewhat desirable in areas where de dust collection may be of concern, such as uh, where food processing is, um, where the horizontal surfaces you get with trusses or, or of wide flanges in a steel system may be an issue in these dust sensitive occupancies. Also, um, in all wood systems, sometimes you get a better lead time on the material, where a, a truss system sometimes has a longer lead time. Smaller scale structures, the all wood system can help limit the number of different trades within the building and help the speed along as well. And as you see in this situation, the aesthetics can be nice with an all wood system. A wood truss system is sometimes popular for the cost associated with the glue lamb beam purlins. This is sometimes more efficient to have a, uh, a truss plated, a steel tr uh, truss plate type of wood truss, and it can be panelized as well. In addition, we can also use a TJI uh, or the um, truss joist as a um, or the, the wood eye joist, I should say, the wood eye joist system, which Trust Joist is one of the manufacturers as well as others. And that is not as popular these days. However, you still will see that occasionally where the purlin is now instead of a sawn piece of lumber, instead of a glue lamb, or instead of a wood truss, it's an eye joist. But probably the most popular system that is being used currently is the panelized hybrid roof system. And I say hybrid because it is actually marrying the wood diaphragm that involving the OSB or plywood with the subperlins or uh, subperlin uh, or stiffeners with nailers that are on top of the steel joists. 
So you have wood nailers that are being placed and screwed onto the steel joists so that we get the benefits of this wood diaphragm system as it's attached to a steel support structure. And this has become very popular because of um, the, the cost that seems to be associated with it seems to be less than uh, the all wood systems where it's permitted. In the hybrid roof system, again, it's still a modular type of system with a panelized layout. The four by eight sheets of plywood or OSB are still aligned in the same direction as they would with the strength axis parallel to our subperlins or stiffeners. And we have now the nailers that are going to be placed on the steel joist. And the joist girders will also receive those nailers as well. Whether it's the hybrid system or an all wood system or a system with wood trusses or steel uh, or with um, the eye joist, we have most of the construction occurring at the ground level. The hangers are placed on the sub -prolins, oftentimes in the shop and shipped out to the field that way. The joist nailers are uh, in a hybrid system are often installed by the joist manufacturer. Whoever is the joist manufacturer for the product will install the, the wood and get that screwed in. And then once it's out to the field, the field ground crew will be installing the sub purlins and the sheathing and attaching them to the full length purlins themselves. And the safety that is by placing this on the ground, the safety of having the workers on the ground is very important. It makes the work go a lot quicker and there's fewer significant um, accidents that could be uh, fatal or serious injury. Then the erection is going to be bringing this entire system, this panel or module, up to the roof where it's lifted and there'll be a couple people on the roof to help facilitate that installation. So here's a, a picture of a wood panelized assembly. About This one's probably about 50 feet long. They're oftentimes 40, 50, 60 feet long and they bring it in with a, a forklift type of uh, lift and they will be installing it close to the, uh, the last member that was installed or the last panel that was installed. And in the hybrid system, of course, now you need a welder up there. And so he will be attaching the ends of the joist for uh, the connection up there. In a wood system, then it would just be someone up there driving some nails into the joist or the purlin hanger as it's installed. Again, we only need a couple people on the roof, which is a nice, strong safety aspect. The other aspect that's beneficial with this system of the panelized system is when you're using trusses, the OSHA requirement for stability bracing on the trusses goes away because the top cord is fully braced. In other systems, such as metal deck systems, where you have steel joists, the contractor is required to put in that OSHA stability bracing because the joists are fully unbraced during the construction and erection process until that steel deck gets placed. There's an exception for this type of system which facilitates its fast speed of erection. These types of systems, by the way, you can get upwards of 30, 40,000 square feet installed in a single day, assuming a nice straight rectangular layout with lots of repetitiveness. So it's a very efficient method of installation, whether it's with steel joists or with solid wood uh, glue lambs, uh, purlins. Any of those are have the strong advantage of this efficiency. The panelized roof system, of course, because of that speed, is very desirable for the big box warehouses, distribution facilities, as well as your big box retail, such as Home Depot or Costco or some of the other name brands that you might have on the West Coast. We will see them being used in the retail market. These larger buildings, of course, when they are nice and open, such as you see this, the, the walls will be installed first, whether they're concrete tilt-up or tilt wall, or if they happen to be uh, masonry. And then the roof system gets installed right along afterwards. What I'd like to do now is now look at the wall-to-roof anchorage. And this wall-to-roof anchorage and the design provisions is really an important part of this system mostly because there has been problems back in the past over the last few decades with seismic and the code has been 
evolving probably the quickest in this area. So it's important to understand sort of where we've been and where we are today. And as part of that, I'm going to be hitting some of the issues that are most important for the wall anchorage design. We'll be looking at cross-grain bending issues. This is bending of wood in cross-grain or cross-grain tension. Also, we'll be looking at the wall anchorage design force, as well as the, eccentric, the eccentricity issues associated with wall anchorage, pilaster issues, those would be the thickened columns that are part of the wall panel or the masonry wall. We'll be looking at the continuity ties as well, and subdiaphragms, which is a unique tool that we can use for the wall anchorage design to help make these buildings even more efficient. So cross-grain bending issues are a very important issue when we look back at the history of heavy wall buildings supported by roof systems. And we'll start off with really the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, or also known as the Silmar earthquake, where this issue really became first, showed its first light. And we had similar issues subsequently in the 1992 Landers Big Bear earthquakes, the 1994 Northridge earthquake as well, and we'll actually see some pictures from the 2001 Nisqually earthquake in Washington state, and most recently the Napa earthquake, which occurred just last year. Cross-grain bending in wood ledgers really are the biggest problem that we have with this type. In, in these earthquakes that you see, most of the damages that we continue to see is from old inventory from pre-1973 Uniform Building Code buildings. The current designs, we haven't seen really strong ground shaking, but we think that we have most of these issues resolved at this point. But let's go back to the 1971 San Fernando earthquake with a couple of pictures where we saw loss of wall panels. This is a tilt-up building with a wood roof system. And we had uh, several, or not several, we had many of these types of buildings damaged where partial collapses of roof systems that occurred during the San Fernando earthquake uh, because of cross-grain bending and the fact that there was no positive connection really of the roof system to the wall. It was all relying upon simply the diaphragm and a ledger connection. And the 1992 Landers earthquake, here's a masonry building. It's a small masonry building. And again, we saw the same problem here. We had improper wall anchorage where it was relying on this cross-grain bending. Not to uh, point the finger only at wood diaphragms. Uh, in the 1992 Landers earthquake, we saw the same problem with steel deck diaphragm in, in this building, uh, Kmart in Yucca Valley, where we had a loss of wall anchorage because of, uh, again, partially because of the wall anchorage forces were much larger than really what we had anticipated. 1994 Northridge earthquake then resulted in many of the same issues, and these were buildings primarily built, again, prior to 1973 Uniform Building Code, but there was also a number of buildings that were built after 1973 that had issues that have continued to affect the building code that we'll see today. The Northridge earthquake had a large number of damaged buildings where from the street it didn't seem that bad, but from a helicopter it was obvious that we had lots of partial roof failures that were occurring in many of these buildings. There was a large contingency of these buildings that were all built around the same time period that had many, many aspects of this wall to roof damage that allowed the wall to remain standing but the roof to collapse. Some cases, the wall was very precariously hanging in almost a catenary shape, a parabola shape, as it was leaning out, such as you see in this building. Uh, but the roof, again, collapsed. And in a number of locations, you could simply see the separation beginning to occur where daylight was coming through the transition between the roof and the wall. In this situation, you see one of these wood girders, uh, a large galulam girder that is attached to the top of a pilaster. And the pilaster to girder connection may have been actually the only thing holding this wall in at this stage. The 2001 Nisqually earthquake in Washington state just indicates that really here's a, 
outside of California has the same issues. They don't quite have as many of the large earthquakes California has had to shed light on this problem, but the problem is not just a California problem. It seems to be uh, a problem associated with wood diaphragms in California, primarily because that is the that has been the diaphragm of choice in California. So the the inventory is so much heavier in the wood diaphragm stage, and I believe that if there was uh, equal number of steel diaphragms in this type of building, we would be seeing a lot more steel damage as well. But the wood diaphragms and the large number of earthquakes in California have led this issue to occur primarily in this state. Certainly, when the wall has lost its entire support, that is much more of a concern. And sometimes the roof will simply collapse, leaving the wall in place. And sometimes the walls have completely fallen from the building. And again, these are in 1994 Northridge earthquake with buildings that were uh, under much older code conditions. And these are not current code conditions, but just simply older codes showing the problems that these buildings have, especially with cross-grain bending. Here's a close-up of a ledger that tends to fail in cross-grain bending in the distance, or more up close, you can actually see the ledger did not fail in cross-grain bending, but we have the nails that were attaching the plywood edge simply pulling out through the plywood edge. This here further illustrates the problems that we have trying to do wall anchorage with just sheathing attached to a wood nailer. It is not going to provide the strength that's necessary due to the weaknesses associated with tearing out through the plywood edge or cross grain bending. And here's a, a simple graphic that you can see that would provide that illustration of that cross grain bending. And for those of you that might be uh, fathers or mothers that have sons or daughters in martial arts such as karate or taekwondo and one of the rites of passage is breaking that wooden board. Well, it's no secret that when they have you break that wooden board, they're actually having you break it through cross-grain bending to make it a lot simpler to do. I'm not going to say it's an easy thing to do, but it's going to be a lot simpler. And so this method of uh, uh, martial arts is simply something we, we don't really want to find in our buildings as it will weaken that wall anchorage. And because of that problem prior to 1973 Uniform Building Code, the code has now introduced provisions that prevent or, or restrict or prohibit that type of behavior. So since the 1970s, there's been no wood cross-grain bending or tension that's been allowed. It now requires a direct connection to the diaphragm and from the wall. The no use of, of toenails or nails and withdrawal are, are permitted. And there's no use of the wood diaphragm sheathing acting as your tension tie. And so this is an ASCE 710 for seismic design categories C through F. And section 1211.223 has those provisions built in. And this is essentially adopted right out of the problems that occurred in 1971 from the San Fernando earthquake. In the 1980s, these were the types of connections you would see, these sheet metal or, or light gauge steel uh, straps that would be embedded in concrete, wrapped around a bar. Uh, oftentimes, our wall anchorage forces are too large to permit these. However, you'll still see these in some instances. But in larger buildings, we have to use something much more robust than this. In that case, we often put in a hold down type of anchorage that's bolted to a subperlant. The subperlin is oftentimes enlarged from a 2 by to maybe a 3 by or 4 by depending on what kind of bolting value we'd need. And then there's an anchor rod embedded in either the concrete wall or in the masonry wall. In situations where it's preferred to have a steel angle ledger, sometimes the cord forces are so large that an engineer would prefer to, instead of using cord bars embedded in the panel, he prefers to use a steel angle as his, as his cord. And a wood nailer can be applied to the top of that. And the anchorage going to the roof system from the wall can simply be, again, this anchor bolt that would penetrate through the wood nailer. Sometimes it's a uh, purlin that's going to be anchored <coughs> to the wall on a wood ledger. 
And this simply in illustrates, again, this pre-engineered wall tie hardware, which would be similar to hold down that you'd use for a shear wall in overturning, can be used for this purpose as well. So we're going to go now to the next polling question. Marcy, let me turn over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, which of the following can be used to provide wall anchorage to a wood diaphragm? A, wood members in cross-grain bending. B, wood members in cross-grain tension. Toenails. B, subperlins. E, nail loaded, nails loaded in withdrawal. All right, 53% have voted. The majority of you have one answer. I'm not going to tell you what that is just yet. All right, 75%. I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. And all right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the poll. All right, so 70% say B, subperlins, 15% say B, wood members in cross-grain tension, 9% um, wood members in cross-grain bending, 4% nails loaded in withdrawal, and 2% toenails. So I would say the majority say the subperlins. So John, I'm going to give it back to you, and you tell me what, the, or tell us what the real answer is. Well, <clears throat> We'll go with uh, the majority is, yes, subperlins is the right answer. So we can use the subperlins as our wall anchorage for the wood diaphragm. We can also use the perlins when they're landing on the other uh, faces of the wall. But we certainly don't want to use the wood members in cross-grain bending or cross-grain tension. We'd like to use parallel to grain tension, but not cross-grain tension. Those are the two issues. Uh, and really cross-grain bending and cross-grain tension is synonymous with one another. They're essentially the same behavior, the same mechanical thing happening within the wood structure is going to create this tension across the grain. And that's where the problem is. The code does not allow toenails or nails loaded in withdrawal, so we have subperlins as our answer. So let's move on to the wall anchorage design force. As I indicated, that we still have problems with post-1973 Uniform Building Code buildings that have direct connections, have eliminated the cross-grain tension and cross-grain bending, and we found that really the wall anchorage design forces were inadequate back in the older codes. Today's code levels, these are what this is the equation for wall anchorage force in ASCE 710. And it's uh, a force that is based on 0.4 times your spectral, your design spectral acceleration at short periods, S sub ds, times the factor k sub a, which is based on the span of the diaphragm. It's a, con a um, variable I will show you. Times the importance factor times the portion of weight of the wall tributary to that wall anchorage. This is what is uh, required for seismic design categories B through D and higher. Most recently, this ASCE 710 has added these for seismic design categories B and C, so there's a fair amount of the United States that's seen this for the first time, these high seismic force levels. These force levels were originally born in the 1997 Uniform Building Code, partially as an outgrowth from the 19... 91 or 19, well, it was the San Francisco earthquake uh, in Loma Prieta where they found the, the values of the wall anchorage force being much lower when, than what they should be. And then the 1994 earthquake really drove the point home in Northridge. And so it got placed in the 1997 Uniform Building Code. And those force levels have been there ever since for seismic design categories D and higher. And then just this last code cycle, they went to B and C. But there's also a threshold 
Um, if you're in low seismic areas where S sub DS, your design spectral acceleration at short periods is, is fairly low, you have a lower threshold of 0.2 times K sub A, I sub E, W sub P. Now that K sub A factor, it's based on the length of the diaphragm between vertical resisting elements. So this K sub A is going to be 1 plus the length of the diaphragm divided by 100, but need not be greater than 2.0. Let me give you a, an example um, in the next slide, but before I do that, I wanted to tell you that these forces here are very high, very high wall anchorage forces. And the reason for that is past performance has really shown that these wall anchorage connections have very limited ductility and very limited overstrength. And so we are designing actually for the maximum expected force levels. They have not been reduced below uh, maximum expected force levels as you would with a like an R factor for a building where you know there's going to be ductility and energy absorption. Instead, we're designing this for what we think the design earthquake is going to actually put onto the building, almost in an, an elastic type of design approach with some consideration for overstrength of the materials. This means that we have multiplied or factored up the ground accelerations by three to four times, which is what they found in the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, on instrumented buildings of this type. This factor K sub A is uh, what I'd like to talk about and it has to do with the distance between shear elements. So here's a sample building that has a distance between, for instance, an interior shear wall to the perimeter walls of 120 feet on the left side of the building and 40 feet on the right side of the building. And these, this distance is now how wide the diaphragm is. And the wider diaphragms, it, it is thought, will have higher accelerations. And so once that diaphragm width goes above 100 feet, that K sub A value will get above 2.0. In this case, K sub A would be 2.2. However, there's a maximum of 2.0 for this type of, for, for the use of K sub A. So our F sub P on the left is going to be 0 0.8 times S sub DS times I sub E, W sub P. And then the factor on the right is simply going to be 0 0.56 because it's only a 40-foot span. So there's a relaxation on the wall anchorage force through, be, based on the span of the diaphragm between the lines of shear resistance. If we look at forces instead of north-south in this picture, we go, say, east-west. The east-west span is 80 feet. And so our K sub A is going to be 1.8, which changes our wall anchorage force F sub P to a factor of 0.72 times S sub DS I sub E times the weight of the wall portion. Now, recent research that I've been working on has shown that this K sub A factor may actually be in question. There may be no uh, legitimate reason to reduce the capacity below a K sub A of 2.0. And so th there's current research looking at the validity of K sub A or whether we should just keep it at 2.0 as if we see on these larger buildings because the, the records that we're seeing for the earthquakes that have caused this dynamic excitation to be placed in the code were for these larger buildings and the smaller buildings we just don't have a lot of data and computer modeling is suggesting that it may not be appropriate to reduce these wall anchorage forces for smaller buildings. So if we're looking at a building and we're looking at wall anchorage forces, we're simply trying to prevent these walls from falling away from the main diaphragm, since the wall weight is oftentimes heavier than the entire diaphragm weight. If I was to do a sample force calculation in this building and I was looking at, for instance, that example building I gave you a plan view of, back here in that back side we had a 0.8 times S sub DS as our wall anchorage force. Now, of course, we have these parapets that, for instance, in this example, here's a 3-foot parapet from a 30-foot high roof line, and this F sub P value is going to be based on this 0.8 times S sub D S based on based on this K sub A of 2.0 that was for this example. And if we assume a short period acceleration of 1.0 for uh, S sub D S, and we have 8 foot anchor spacing for say the purlin spacing, and we had an 8 inch thick wall, W sub P, the 
the weight of the wall that would be tributary to that wall anchorage would be 14,000 pounds, 520. So we're looking at that times 0.8 giving us a wall anchorage force of 11,616 pounds, a pretty significant uh, wall anchorage force, but not unusual at all for the west coast. Now with this force that we're trying to pull into our roof system, we have these eccentricity issues that we might have with our wall anchorage system. So here's the detail. And do we want it both sides? Do we want these wall anchorage connectors on both sides? Well, that's twice as much hardware. It's going to be more difficult to install this because now you've got a contractor or a framer that's going to be drilling that hole and it better be darn perpendicular to that surface in order to get it to line up for the bolts on the far side. And with only a 16th of an inch oversized permissible in that bolt hole, is there's a lot of contractors that would prefer to have this on one side. However, by putting it on one side, if the engineer goes ahead and does that, it's going to introduce some issues associated with the eccentricity. And there's actually provision in ASE 7, section 121226, that says eccentrically loaded anchorage has to consider these these other components that are going to be coming into the wall anchorage. So in essence, I'm not worried about necessarily the anchorage to the concrete. I'm worried about what is happening to this purlin or subperlin associated with this eccentricity. And this eccentricity is going to be simply placing a moment now in combination with a tension force. So I have a moment associated with the tie force times eccentricity, and this creates a combined axial tension and bending moment. And this problem now needs to be addressed if I decide or elect to create a single-sided connection. So always keep this in mind. This is for seismic design categories C through F that we have to address this eccentricity with combined tension and bending moment as it might affect my subperlin or perlin. We would certainly prefer to see a, a concentric type of connection where we have no eccentricity. That would be our preference. Now, I'll, next I would like to visit pilaster issues. And pilaster issues were something that came out of the 1994 Northridge earthquake where it was obvious that even though we had direct wall connections of steel straps to our wall panels, we found that the load was simply being attracted to these stiff pilaster elements in the walls, whether it was masonry or concrete. The glue lamb beams that were in this picture attached to these pilasters were taking the a much larger disproportionate share of the wall anchorage than was originally assumed. These stiffened ribs, as they could be thought of, of, of the walls were attracting a fair amount of load and dumping that load right into the connection of the glue lamb beam seat, leaving much of the wall strapping up at the roof level unloaded. Here's a close-up picture of a steel beam attached to a pilaster, and you can see the spalling that's occurring. Here's a wood roof, uh, there's a wood, pi uh, a wood um, ledger there, but we still lost the, the steel beam. Here's a connection that is just about to fail of a wood glue lamb beam onto a pilaster, and the pilaster has a significant split. Again, the connection was not able to take the significant amount of wall anchorage force that was out of plane at this location. This is the 2014 Napa earthquake. Just last year, again, this problem came through. A, an older building, but nevertheless, we saw the large concentration of forces that come into the pilaster in both of these photos, where a significant amount of spalling occurred and we were on the verge of a wall anchorage or a, of a uh, partial roof collapse. Again the Napa earthquake, uh, storage of wine barrels, a significant amount of inventory with a fairly high uh, value associated with it, a masonry building with a pilaster and the glue lamb beam support was lost. 
Here you see the glue lamb beam anchorage to a uh, beam seat that was with a couple rebar embedded in the pilaster. And on the left, you see that seat that's attached to the beam still. And on the right, you see the pilaster simply spalled away. And these should have probably had more ties. You would have probably at least liked to see three, number three or number four ties wrapping around that um, base, uh, that beam seat in the upper five inches of the pilaster. So a fair amount of weakness has occurred there. But this is really just simply illustrating the problem we have with pilasters attracting a large amount of load. So in response to this, again, a lot of these sections were introduced into the 1997 Uniform Building Code following the Northridge earthquake as a reaction to what was observed. And they have followed their way into the ASCE 710 ASCE 710 seismic design categories C through F have certainly this warning about walls with pilasters indicating that where pilasters are present, the wall anchorage associated with the pilaster has to consider the additional load that's transferred from the wall panel to the pilasters. And it doesn't really give much guidance except indicating that there's going to be some additional load. In addition, um, well, what, what I'm going to show following up is really how that can be applied in your buildings where you have a pilaster. How do you determine how much might, load might actually travel to that pilaster? And so if we're looking at an elevation and we're trying to find the reaction to this glue lamb beam at the top of a pilaster, well we can simply go borrow simply what, um, what maybe the concrete industry looks at as far as a flat slab and that is their yield line theory. So if you have a two-way slab that is concrete, which we can think of as being our walls, except they're vertical. A flat slab has essentially this yield line theory where you would have ultimate failure occurring along these different lines for something that is, has a four-sided perimeter on it. And if we take this yield line theory and now apply it to a, a wall that would be with pilasters, we can apply those yield lines to the surface of the wall and think about now what is going to be tributary to the slab on grade, what's going to be tributary to the pilasters, and what's going to be tributary up there to the roof. And now we're simply going to create a tributary area that would be associated with the pilaster, and it's this odd shape that we have, but, but it's making a logical sense as far as justifying the load that goes to that pilaster. And if we think about that as being our W sub P in our wall anchorage force, and what is now going to be creating the distributed load onto that pilaster, we can go ahead and look at a cut, a section cut of our wall with the pilaster, and we have this non-uniform distributed load for the design of our pilaster, but more importantly, F sub P, this wall anchorage force, is based on a propped beam that has a parapet cantilever with this non-uniform distributed load. And now we have a means of calculating F sub P. So that comes to our next polling question, Marcy. Question number three, and I'll let you take it from here. All righty. Wall anchorage at Pilast, Pilaster, sorry. Um, Let's see, A, they result from a uniform wall load, B, attract more anchorage load from the wall, they C, cause eccentric loading, D, are not a load allowed per the code, or E, have no effect. All right, so 30% of you have already voted. Keep voting. Wow, one vote or one answer certainly stands out from the rest. Excellent. All right. 70% have voted, about 10 more seconds, and let's close the poll. All right, and I will share the answer. So that one uh, answer is that they attract more anchorage load from the wall. 88% of you voted for that one. 9% voted for they cause eccentric loading and just um, a couple of you said they result for, from a uniform wall load or have no effect. So let's see what the real answer is, John. And the real answer is where most of you were paying attention, uh, it attracts more load from the wall, and that is certainly our concern. It doesn't cause an eccentric load unless you have 
Uh, and, and again, the, the eccentric load is looking in plan about weak axis. Uh, certainly someone could say, well, the load's coming in at the bottom of the, of the purlin or the bottom of the girder, and that's sort of eccentric, but it's eccentric about the strong axis, and that's really not the intent of concern. Uh, the members have plenty of strength to take that combined bending and tension about the strong axis usually, so that's not usually where we're worried about. And it's not from a uniform wall load. Uh, you could conservatively assume it's a uniform wall load and neglect that yield line theory and just simply say, well, my pilasters are taking a tributary width from pilaster to pilaster halfway and uh, and and, and be very conservative in your wall anchorage, and, and that's certainly acceptable. I simply showed you a more uh, accurate way that you could approach the problem. Uh, anchorage to the pilasters is certainly allowed per code, so D is not going to be there, and E certainly has an effect, and that's what the code section is trying to um, address. So let's move on from really the getting the load once it's out of the wall into the diaphragm, we need to look at continuing that load into the diaphragm deeper away from the wall. And this is going to be done with what are called continuity ties, or sometimes they're called continuity or, or cr uh, continuous cross ties is an old terminology that you will see sometimes as well. So these continuity ties are necessary to make sure that once we've attached the load to the diaphragm, we want to make sure the diaphragm is capable of taking the load further away from the wall. If we simply attach it to the diaphragm and then stop, then we risk having these internal failures inside the building just simply because there's too much wall anchorage force for that localized area close to the wall. So we need to tie the building across, and the continuity ties are the way we're going to do that. And in fact, ASCE 710 has for seismic design category C through F, again, this was uh, placed into the code, uh, indicating that the diaphragms have to have these continuous ties or struts between diaphragm cords to distribute the wall anchorage forces into the diaphragm. So it's important to get this from cord to cord. And these forces, uh, in the, you can see what happened in this picture. This is illustrating if we don't have continuity ties and we're going to use the diaphragm sheathing itself in tension, it's not an effective continuity tie because the diaphragm sheathing has edge nailing into common members. And if you're placing it in tension, you're now putting that common member into cross grain tension. And what you see here is on the left, you can actually see nails that were bent over as the diaphragm sheathing pulled out past the nail through tear out, and then on the right you can actually see the cross grain tension splitting open the top of the glue lamb beam and allowing the nails to withdraw. So this is not what we want. We want to have a positive connection across these interior lines from purlin to purlin, from sub purlin to sub purlin, so we have a continuous tie across the building. This cross grain tension is essentially what's happening here, and this is not permitted per the code for seismic. In the 1994 earthquake in uh, Northridge, even buildings that had these positive connections, and you see here we have a, a, a twist strap that was installed from purlin to purlin to provide this continuity uh, force from, for wall anchorage. We have this continuity strap that is still used today, um, but when they're not properly designed for the right force, then we can actually have problems with the steel itself. And that is where we're going next is the steel element issue. In the Northridge earthquake, this was what was very concerning was the fact that these steel straps were rupturing at the net section. And in fact, subsequent tests of the steel found that there was limited ductility of the steel straps that the steel straps had very limited ductile range above first yield, and since that was a problem, we, we really could not get the absorption of the energy and the overstrength that we had thought was there. And so what has happened is they simply say on these steel elements that you need to design them for a 1.4 factor. And that was placed in the 1997 Uniform Building Code, again, as a reaction to the 1994 Northridge earthquake. 
that ductility cannot be counted on, and the steel elements are vulnerable. In fact, it was found through large uh, th through through testing that the steel elements had were more vulnerable than the wood elements. That the wood elements actually were more forgiving to the over uh, loads than the steel elements were. And so the steel elements were subjected now to this 1.4 factor for any steel elements that are part of the structural wall anchorage system. The exception are anchor bolts. Anchor bolts are in tension, um, and they're often relying on the concrete, that the 1.4 does not apply to them. Reinforcing steel has a, sub, a significant amount of ductility that it is not necessarily uh, necessary to be subject to the 1.4. And also, uh, steel elements that are part of the wood anchorage, such as screws or bolts in the wood itself, are not subjected to this 1.4 increase. This is primarily for the steel elements themselves that are part of this wall anchorage system. So the capacity of the wall anchorage system, this was a formula that we showed you before, the design forces, the 0.4 times S sub DS times K sub A, I sub E, W sub P. They've all been carefully coordinated now with the maximum with, with, the, with the expected material overstrength of the anchorage materials. So the idea is that we want our wall anchorage force then to have a uniform risk of the material as far as where the failure might occur. So the 1.4 is applied to steel. And those of you that have worked under the 1997 Uniform Building Code might remember that you would design wood elements for 85% of this force because they were found to be much less vulnerable. So you actually got a 15% reduction in force for the design of wood elements, a 40% increase in the design for steel elements, and at par for masonry and concrete. Since then, the ASC 7, when it adopted the 97 UBC language, has removed that 15% reduction, or 85%. And so we simply now have left in the code the 1.4 factor for steel elements. So these steel elements with this 1.4 additional factor is to prevent this fracturing from occurring and making sure we have a more uniform risk. There is more on this subject in the 1999 SEOC Blue Book that can be found um, maybe online, but you can find a commentary about how this was all determined. Wood elements, again, there's no additional factor that's needed for wood, and that includes the bolts, the screws, and the nails, since they're governed by the wood primarily and not fracturing of the steel. So once we find these forces for a continuity ties, we have, for instance, in this building, we have forces that may be pulling the walls to the north, away from the building or from the south away from the building, and we need to tie the building together with these continuity ties all the way across. So our continuity tie is taking those tension forces and tying and knitting the building together so we don't have those interior fractures inside the building. And our typical tie connection, such as we saw, that we don't want to, to fracture that's being designed for that 1.4 more load of its steel, is right at maybe a girder line that you would see here. And here's an example of what's often done in an all-wood system is you'll have, again, our hold-down bracket, but now we're simply using them in pairs from one side of the girder to the other. And again, they should be on both sides so we don't have eccentricity issues so that we can simply have a nice concentric load through the center of the glue lamb beam. These continuity ties, unfortunately, are going to happen fairly often. But Reasonably so, they're just at the girder lines, and so the end of each purlin might have one of these connections to tie the buildings together, and you may decide to do every purlin so that you keep the loads reasonably low. If we look at a wood truss system, we would have these connections occurring at pretty much every one of these glue lamb beams to tie it together. And if the loads are low enough, they can simply be a nailed-on strap over top the sheathing or uh, at the top of the uh, roof system. If it's a much larger load, then we would use maybe some sort of hold down that would go through. It becomes a little bit more difficult with the wood truss doing the hold down, but if the loads are fairly light, a, a strap over the top is going to be fairly efficient and cost effective. These continuity ties in these large buildings, we have to worry about the other direction as well, where our sub prunes are, and this is where it becomes a little bit more complex. We're going to be designing for the same force as the wall anchorage system, this 0.4 times S sub DS, K sub A, I sub E, 
and the steel elements of the wall anchorage system, these con are the, of the continuity ties, will also be for the 1.4 steel element factor. And so if we're using not only just steel joists or steel uh, straps, but we have steel joists, such as the hybrid roof system, technically speaking, that steel joist needs the 1.4 steel element load factor on it. There's nothing in the code that lets you say it's just the connector, that the steel joist itself is going to be subject to that 1.4 as well, because it is considered part of the wall anchorage system. And it is what's going to be extending from cord to cord, this continuity tie. In the sub purlin directions, going from cord to cord is going to be a little bit more of a problem. If we have our tie force going into our roof system, that's a lot of continuity ties. And in fact, it's not so much the number of continuity ties, but as the number of connections. I mean, each one of these connections now is going to happen at every purlin, which is every eight feet on center. And this can be a very inefficient way of making our continuity ties from left to right, from east to west. Here's a typical continuity tie that you would have for a sub purlin, a strap over the top. The forces are much lower here, so we can do straps over the top and, and provide a, nail, uh, a nailed-on strap. And again, that strap is going to be subject to the 1.4 load factor. But we can use a new tool called, no, I wouldn't say new tool, but I'm presenting it here now for you as uh, a sub-diaphragm. And a sub-diaphragm is an analytical method of focusing our continuity ties into larger main continuity ties. So the definition in ASE 7 is that it's a portion of a larger wood diaphragm designed to anchor and transfer local wall forces to the primary struts and to the main diaphragm. So essentially it's a smaller diaphragm in a larger diaphragm or a mini diaphragm in a sense, like, like a nested diaphragm system. And their use is permitted under ASE 710 for seismic design categories C and F, it's where we have these large wall anchorage provisions. So if we again look at our wall anchorage system, we're going to simply now say our sub-diaphragm is going to be these little portions at the extreme east and west side of this building. So when I have this wall anchorage force that's going to pull on my building, I'm going to identify the sub-diaphragm now as a beam element that's going to go from my girder out to the wall system. So I'm going to funnel that force to my continuity ties, which are going to be my girders. So I'm going to be looking at main girder continuity ties. Instead of tying the whole building across and with all those connections at every eight feet, I'm simply going to focus the load now in my continuity of my girder. And I'll do that on both sides. So the, both the east and the west are going to be providing the same funneling of the load. And my continuity ties now for the main diaphragm are my girders. Far more efficient. The girders are already going to be continuous. And I have much fewer connections that I need to worry about. Again, this continuity tie is part of the wall anchorage system. So it's going to be the same force, that 0.4 S sub DS times K sub A, I sub E, and W sub P. The aspect ratio of these sub-diaphragms are limited to a 2.5 to 1. So in essence, that 2.5 to 1 would be looked at from this standpoint, where the span of the sub-diaphragm can be 2.5 times longer than the depth of the sub-diaphragm. And it's the depth of the sub-diaphragm is up to the designer to decide what he would like or she that depth to be. Obviously, the sub-diaphragm shears within that for that wall anchorage have to be manageable and you're going to be designing the depth of your sub-diaphragm potentially just for the shear load that you have trying to take that wall anchorage force out of the sub-diaphragm and into the perimeter or the continuity tie. Our sub-diaphragm, since it is acting as a diaphragm, is going to, are going to have uh, cords as well. So the sub-diaphragm is going to have its own independent cord and oftentimes, though, the axial force in that cord is less than the wall tie force in the orthogonal direction. So oftentimes, that sub-diaphragm cord force is not even going to govern the size of that, core, of that joist or that purlin. The wall anchorage force is going to be higher, and it becomes really a non-issue. But you need to be aware of what, what's happening here. You are, in fact, making an independent mini-diaphragm here for managing those loads.
And again, those loads are being managed and being sent to the continuity tie. And this continuity tie is not going to have just the reaction from one subdiaphragm. It's going to have the reaction from the adjacent subdiaphragm too. So both of these reactions get added together and dumped into this continuity tie for distribution across the building. So when we look at this distribution across the building with our main continuity ties, we're going to have these connection issues. This girder that is running across the building will, of course, not be continuous, and we need to worry about those connections. And if we think about, a, uh, again, the wall anchorage force is moving into our continuity tie, those connections, again, are designed for the same 0.4 times S sub DS, K sub A, I sub E. Something that a lot of people aren't really checking, aren't really aware of, is there is a minimum interconnection force requirement in ASCE 7. And this is in section, um, well, there's, it, it comes up in a number of different sections about structural integrity of the building. Uh, ASCE 7 section 1.4.2 uh, addresses this, as well as 12.1.3 and 12.1.4 all have minimum threshold requirements for interconnection of a building so that a building, when you have smaller parts of a building attached to larger parts of a building or what's happening within a building, we need to make sure that it's connected together in a fairly robust method. And so your wall anchorage continuity tie force isn't allowed to drop to zero or something way below this threshold, so it should always be checked. And when you're wondering what W is, W is the weight of the smaller portion of the building to one side of the connection. So if we're looking, for instance, in this situation, and we have our continuity tie connection, and we're trying to determine, well, what is that W involved? Well, this is the tributary area of W for our wall anchorage connection. It's going to be for that threshold that we were talking about. It would be the tributary to one side, the smaller part of the building to one side of the connection. And that's where that 0.133 times S sub DS times W would be invoked. When we're looking at a panelized roof system and wondering where that connection might be, well, it's this hinge connector that you would see here at a girder glue lamb girder with uh, the can lever picking up the smaller drop-in girder. And there's manufacturers that make these. Um, there's a number of manufacturers that are able to provide tension seismic forces through these connections, and those are going to be of great benefit to the engineer tying his building together without worrying about supplemental straps or other ties if the loads are sufficient. If the loads exceed these hinge connectors, you can supplement it or surpass it with uh, hold downs again across the hinge to provide that tie. Now, what I've expressed here during the wall anchorage portion of this presentation is that everything, everything seems to be the reaction after an earthquake. And I've created this, this uh, graph to show you sort of this timeline of history about major earthquakes and the provisions that come into the code following them. In the San Fernando earthquake, after the San Fernando earthquake in 71, you find that in 1973 uniform building code, the wall ties, the cross ties, no cross grain bending was uh, allowed. Then in 1976 uniform building code, subdiaphragms got introduced, um, partially because those wall ties and the cross tie requirements were really a difficult thing to achieve in the subdiaphragm or the uh, subperlin direction. So the subdiaphragm issue came into uh, recognition in the 76 UBC. 1979 Uniform Building Code, the wall anchorage force was increased uh, again about 50%. Then in 1990, 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake happened. Uh, the wall anchorage force was increased again in the 1991 Uniform Building Code. The Landers earthquake, the Northridge earthquake happened. We got more, uh, more concerned about the overstrength and the lack of ductility in the connections. We bumped the wall anchorage force now up what we believe is the maximum expected wall anchorage force in a design event. And you can see the wood, concrete, and masonry are designed there at uh, 0.8. You see the seismic coefficient there on the left. That's a strength design seismic coefficient. 
So all those older uniform building codes have actually been modified to bring it up to be consistent on a strength level. And we have the 0.8 times S sub DS there. Um, and then if we were at steel elements, we have another 40% uh, increase on that value. And again, the concentrically loaded and special pilaster rules are in place. Unfortunately, I don't see any more red lines there. Napa was not really a design event to cause the code to really reevaluate too much. Uh, the Nisqually earthquake in 2001 wasn't enough, so we, we have a fair amount of history here from 1994 that we haven't had a significant earthquake testing these current provisions. And when we do, we may find ourselves revisiting some of these requirements. So now we're down to um, the last polling question before we take a little question and answer break. And Marcy, why don't you take it? All righty, here we go. Which one of the following is not a special, special consideration for wall anchorage? Is it A, 1.4 times more design force at wood elements? B, moments at eccentric con connections? C, ties continuous across building? D, higher loads at pilasters? Or E, subdiaphragms permitted? All right. And it looks like about 40% of you have voted. And a few more seconds. The majority of you are voting one way. It's usually indicative of the, the right answer, so that's good. All right. Just a couple more seconds. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Sharing the poll. Oh, oh I lost the poll. That's not good. Um, I'm sorry. One second here. Let's see if I can bring it back up. Ah, I'm sorry. Here, let me tell you. I've got 64% say 1.4 more design force at wood elements. 11% say moments at eccentric connections. 12% sub diaphragms permitted, and 7% higher loads at pilasters. So um, I apologize for that. Let me send this back to um, John. All right. Well, I think uh, most of you got this right. Um, the question was, which is not a special consideration for wall anchorage? And there is a 1.4 more force requirement, but at steel elements, not wood elements. And so A is correct because there is not a requirement for 1.4 more design force at wood elements. The others are are definitely requirements. Moments are required at eccentric connections to be considered. Ties have to be continuous across the building. That is from cord to cord. There are higher loads associated with the attractiveness of, of the pilasters being stiffer. And then subdiaphragms are permitted as an analytical tool to help minimize the continuity ties across the building. So uh, the answer is, is A. And at this point, we're going to have a brief break from uh, the wall anchorage portion of this before we go into the main diaphragm. And so we'll be able to uh, answer some questions. And uh, while that's going on, I'm going to, I uh, lost the dashboard side of my presentation. So I'm just going to break back out a little bit. And Buddy, I think you're going to come in and ask some questions or answer some yep. questions. Yep, I'm here, uh, John. And uh, we had a couple of questions come in. so. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the alignment of hold down anchor bolts and relative to the ledger uh, anchor bolts, whether uh, those have to be aligned or um, are there some detailing uh, tips there that would be helpful for the audience? Okay, that's, um, if I understand the question, you're worried about the fact that you have ledger bolting that uh, is possibly holding a steel ledger or a wood ledger, and whether we need to align the wall anchorage hold downs or ties with those ledger bolts. And that can be that can be difficult unless you have a framer that's very good at laying out his purlins and sub purlins and being spot on. Or you can simply attach uh, you can have a, a separate dedicated uh, bolt coming out for your hold down. Uh, or your wall tie. I've seen it successfully done both ways. Um, if you're in a jurisdiction that will permit the use of a post-installed 
anchorage, uh, such as an epoxy anchor or an undercut anchor or, or something of that nature, then the alignment issue sort of becomes less of an issue because you can actually drill in your post-installed anchor right where you want it. Uh, but more often than not, I have seen the framer coordinate the location of his bolts carefully with the concrete subcontractor pouring the concrete panels or the mason putting up the masonry wall to get those bolts fairly close to where he expects them to have for his wall anchorage. Okay, thanks. Um, with the sub-diaphragm method, does the load at the purlin often become too large to anchor to the wall? The, I'm not sure I understand the question. The, the sub-diaphragm is, the sub-diaphragm is being used to, to gather the sub-purlin anchorage loads and distribute them into the continuity ties. The purlins are only being used as a sub-diaphragm cord. So I'm not sure, the sub-diaphragm is really a tool to help the sub-purlins in their anchorage and not the purlins. Buddy, I mean, do, do you have a different approach to what that question means? No, that's, that's about as much as I have at the, at the moment. But let's, uh, let's take one more, and then maybe we'll get some clarification on that one for the Q&A at the end. Um, talk a little bit about uh, diaphragm nailing. We've got these continuity ties, and I know you, you mentioned the boundary nailing is assumed, but uh, talk a little bit more about coordinating that with the contractors and boundary nailing at these connector uh, ties. All right, that's, that's an excellent question. I probably probably should have dealt a little bit more on that because I see it as a problem in the field quite a bit. Your sub-diaphragm, of course, is going to be designed as a little mini diaphragm. So it in itself has a boundary nailing associated with it. And one of the boundaries of the sub-diaphragm is at your girder continuity tie. And so you need to have boundary nailing of your sub-diaphragm, of the main diaphragm, essentially at your girder line. And the other sub-diaphragm adjacent needs boundary nailing there. Well, usually your boundary nailing and your continuous edge nailing is the same for diaphragm shears. But you're not going to have a continuous edge all along your girder. The way they build these panelized roof systems is they will be laying out the sheets of plywood, but they'll hold back the sheet of plywood that gets placed over the girder. So you're not guaranteed to have a continuous edge at your girder. In fact, it will probably be every other sheet of plywood will have an edge on your girder if you're lucky. And so those sheets that get placed and straddle your girder, you may get the framer just simply putting in field nailing, which is nails at 12 inches on center, one row. But you, it's, it's imperative for the sub-diaphragm that you have two lines of boundary nailing along the depth of your sub-diaphragm. So it is important to place that on your drawings. And in my office, when I had that on my drawings, I still would go out to the field and find it missed because the framer is so in tune with just placing field nailing at the interior elements of the girders. So it's something to look out for, something to flag on your drawings, and it's a great, very good question. Okay. Well, why don't we uh, continue on, John, and we'll uh, tee up a few more questions at the end. All right. Well, we're going to move on now into main diaphragm design. <clears throat> and the main diaphragm design is a little more, a lot of us are a little bit more used to, uh, of course, the principles that go with main diaphragm, so I'm not going to dwell into simple main diaphragm with our cords and their shears, but I'm going to highlight those issues that are unique to what we're looking at in a panelized roof system with heavy walls. And there's a sort of a, a, a bird's eye view of a tilt-up building here with nine and a quarter inch panels and a wood roof system. It's 200 by 400, so it's a decent sized building. And I'm going to be using this as sort of an example to just simply show how these buildings get engineered um, as a seismically loaded diaphragm. And I'm showing seismic loads from the east and seismic loads from the north. However, recognize that these loads do not occur simultaneously. We simply look at the two orthogonal directions independently but we need to make sure that it's designed for both east-west loading and north-south loading, but not necessarily at the same time. So 
our diaphragm design for this type of building. Normally you'll find the girders running along the length of the building. This is typically the most efficient uh, layout. And we would have purlins, such as those shown here at eight feet on center. And then the little sub purlins or stiffeners you see just simply graphically shown in the middle with that staggered layout of the sheathing. Um, in this case, we're typically dealing with 15, 30 seconds struck one OSB with a staggered layout. This is the most common way that these buildings are built. In fact, if you are in an area that is not necessarily the Pacific Northwest or where you have rain and snow or in other climates where you might have snow, if you aren't specifying 15, 30 seconds, you'll probably get a call from the contractor that does the roof erection saying, I haven't seen this, this sheathing very often and I just want to double check that that's the sheathing thickness because it is that common that 15, 30 seconds is simply used. We're going to go over in these issues about the shear nailing associated with this plywood thickness. We're going to talk about the cords, the collectors, some irregularities, diaphragm deflections, and the deformation compatibility issues that are associated with this, and then we'll end with some questions. So shear nailing, when we're looking at the shear nailing, as I indicated, on this sample building, we have this load coming into the building, and the diaphragm forces per ASC 710 are... Um, based on in a multi-story building, this equation where you have the summations and the numerator and denominator, but it simply all works out to be a very simple equation for a one-story building. Don't forget you have to respect the maximum and minimum for diaphragm forces. Um, that's all fairly routine and I'm not going to dwell on that much. But if we start looking at this building now with these loads, and again I have north-south loads and east-west loads here shown together, but we are simply looking at each one independently. For the sample building, we'll assume an intermediate precast shear wall, which we'll say is the tilt-up building. It has an R of 4. We'll assume it's in a fairly seismic area, seismic design category D, and it's going to be a S sub DS of 1G. And based on that, we would get this 0.25 um, times the tributary weight in the north-south direction and in east-west direction. That's my seismic factor, unfactored seismic design load into the diaphragm. I take for my sample building that I showed you the picture of, I come up with my uniform load that is unfactored, and I have shear, these uh, shear diagrams and reactions shown for the diaphragm. So obviously looking at the shear, the shear is zero dead center of the building. So it wouldn't be nice to reduce the number of nails as I get closer to the middle of the building in line with my shear demand. I don't want to design the entire building for the worst case shear because that would not be very efficient for a building this size, a fairly large building. So what I need to think about first is what kind of diaphragm am I using? I'm going to use a panelized roof system, which typically is this 15, 30 second struck one. We use structural one, by the way, because remember the plywood is spanning the weak axis. I have the strength axis parallel to the sub lens. So it is not capable of really supporting very much load if those sub are at 24 inches on center, which they are, most efficient, if I use just regular rated sheathing. So I'm going to use struck one to get that strength across the weak direction. And the 15, 30 seconds gets me some nice high diaphragm values. It's fully blocked by the inherent panelized system. And I'm looking at case two and four layouts as far as the way they're going to be. They're staggered, as you see in these drawings. So I'm going to be going into the tables in the NDS. These are nominal values. These are all strength-based values. For ASD, which primarily most engineers are still designing these wood systems by, they're using a, a allowable stress design, we take these nominal values and we divide by two. Here's my structural one, structural one with 10 penny nails with a uh, minimum penetration of inch and a half. 15, 30 seconds is my nominal thickness or minimum thickness, and that gives us for 6-6 six, six nailing where I've got 6 inches at all the edges and the boundaries, 320 pounds per linear foot. That's a 640 divided by 2. So that's allowable stress design. And I can similarly do this for all the other nailing patterns. If I can't get six, uh, 320 to work as my shear, then I can get up to 425 or 640 or 820. But that 820 is still not enough for this building because I wanted to do this building without an interior shear element. I have shears that are too high. So I'm going to have to use table instead of 4.2a, I'm going to go to 4.2b probably. Um, oh, incidentally, I'm going to label these 
at the bottom there, you see I'm going to label these uh, zones 1, 2, 3, and 4, so I can communicate this to the framer where I'm going to have specific nailing. And each one's going to have 2 by framing, except to get to that 820 pounds per linear foot, I'm going to use 3 by framing at the edges. Then I go to my 4.2b, I have my high load diaphragms, and the high load diaphragms are going to be giving me these higher shears way beyond the 820. I can get up to, as you see here, zone 6 with 4 by framing at the edges. I'm going to get 1290 pounds per linear foot. And this is going to allow me to then design this diaphragm. So here's my diaphragm. And I've looked at my shears, and my ASD shear at the far perimeter east and west walls was 1,157 pounds per linear foot in uh, ASD. And I'm going to need that zone 6 nailing configuration. And then as the nailing gets dropped slower, uh, lower and lower and lower, I'm going to find myself reducing it at these different places. Uh, I'm going to find these points of demarcation at purlin lines where I can go from zone 6 to 5 to 4 to 3 to 2 and to 1 where I have my lowest nailing. This is north-south. I'm going to create this drawing of my zones, these strips, where my high shears are demanding high nailing patterns at the far extreme east and west. And in that center section where the zones, shears are much lower, I can simply relax the nailing. And I'll do this also for east-west. In my east-west, I find that really it's not going to be too bad because it's a nice narrow diaphragm. I'm just going to be placing about 20 feet of zone 2 out there. And this would be the nailing pattern I would then provide to my uh, contractor, my framer, for nailing the roof. Nice, efficient method of addressing the shear demands as they may change across the building. So when I look at the cord design now, the cords are simply looking at it as a regular beam where I have compression on the top and tension on the bottom, but now it's a big flat beam. And so it's simply the bending moment that I would have as if it was a beam with maximum moment at mid-span divided by the width of the diaphragm. So that would tell me my tension and compression cords for the design of the diaphragm. And oftentimes these cords are simply going to be rebar that might be in the wall or can be the ledger if I decide to use a steel ledger with a wood nailer on it. And so I can go ahead and, and decide what I want my cord to look like. Let's move on to collectors. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much into the fundamental parts of collectors, but I at least need to talk about how they're going to affect this type of building. And if we look at, now we've put a reentrant corner in this building, and these reentrant corners are going to probably act as stiffened shear elements. And so this is a new line of resistance that I've added, this reentrant corner, and it's going to need a collector off the end. And so I have a diaphragm to the left, a diaphragm to the right, I have pounds per linear foot of shear that are going to be designed on each side, and they're going to feed into this collector. And the collector's job, its role is to act as almost like a continuity tie, but then deliver this load into the end of a shear wall. Could be also a brace frame, doesn't have to be a shear wall, but it's a critical nature of these collectors. And if I look at this in plan view now for this exact same example, I can see these V1s and V2s. These are those unit shears that are collecting. And one, the V2 is actually across the whole length because it was coming from one side of the collector that worked its way all the way past the shear wall, where V1 was actually for just that smaller portion of the diaphragm that is only touching the collector, does not even touch the shear wall directly. And so the collector force is really the V1 plus the V2, those unit shears, times the length of the collector. Plus, uh, you're going to have some load coming directly into the shear wall as well from V2. Going to east-west, I would do the same approach. I would find my shear diagram on my diaphragm, and I would recognize that those shears, those unit shears V1 and V2, which are in pounds per linear foot, are going to be adding together on the collector, and the collector is now going to be collecting those two additively and then depositing them with that big capital F force into the end of my shear wall. So this way our equilibrium is established and I can so totally follow the loads through the diaphragm to this location. 
of course, this 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 uh, reentrant wall probably has people in their mind thinking, "Hey, that's a that's an irregular building." So let's talk about sort of these irregularities that you can get in these types of buildings, because very often these large buildings have reentrant corners associated with distribution of a product warehouse. Um, uh, logistics facilities where they have truck docks and they have office pods that stick out or just a retail big box warehouse such as uh, Home Depot where they have a a truck dock where they want to have the building pop out so you would have a building that may simply again look like this reentrant corner irregularity where this reentrant corner is now possibly going to cause a problem for the building as far as how it's going to be looked at and if we look at this building from a reentrant corner standpoint, seismic design categories D, E, and F require us to evaluate whether a reentrant corner irregularity has created a um, some increased forces that are placed elsewhere in the code. Reentrant corner irregularity in ASE 7 is defined where you both plan projections beyond this reentrant corner are greater than 15% the plan dimension of the structure in the given direction. And that can be kind of hard to visualize. And so I've created this slide for you, right? Uh, no, nope, not there. Here we go. There's the slide that allows you to sort of look at what is being compared here for that 15%. Do I have an irregularity here? So I would be looking at the length of the building in each direction and then looking at how far does the projection go beyond this reentrant corner. Is it greater than 15%? And in the east-west direction, you can see that 296-foot projection is way greater than the 15% length of 400 feet. And in the other direction, the 50 feet of that projection is actually greater than the 15% of 250. So we actually have an irregularity associated with this picture that you see here. So a plan irregularity does exist. And here's our language from ASE 7, section 12334. It says that increases in the forces due to these irregularities are important to consider. And the design forces have to be increased 25% for the following elements. So when I have this irregularity associated with a reentrant corner, I have to increase my design forces 25% for, and I've boxed there, the connections of the diaphragms to the vertical elements and to the collectors. So that is sometimes misunderstood. So let's talk a little bit more about what's going on there. So if I look at this irregularity, this reentrant corner irregularity, I'm going to identify now which, uh, where my cords are. So in my cords here, we'll go ahead and identify in the north-south direction um, where the perimeter would be. This is where the diaphragm is connecting to the vertical elements and to the collectors in the north-south direction. And if I look east-west, and I'm wondering, well, let's see, it said I had to increase 25% for, again, where the, where the diaphragm is connecting to the vertical elements and to where the collectors are. So I'm going to identify where those might be. And so this would be the east-west direction here. So if I merge those two together, north-south and east-west, I've now identified the perimeter or boundaries of my diaphragms where the diaphragm connects to the east-west and the north-south locations where I have vertical elements and my collectors. So these are all then potentially where they want that 25% increase in forces. Now, what elements are we actually increasing at these locations? Well, let's look at where the wall occurs, where the diaphragm occurs and it meets the wall. Anchor bolting. This is where the diaphragm is the shears transferring to the wall itself. This increase in forces is not the wall anchorage force. This is the shear force that we're worried about. So the anchor bolting of the ledger needs to be designed for 25% more shear, as you see here. The diaphragm, though, if we think about the nailing of the diaphragm, that is not subject to it. This is not the intent of this section of the code. It's where the diaphragm assembly is going to the wall, and the nailing is still within the diaphragm. It is not subject to the 25%. The concern is really this attachment of ledgers and collectors to the diaphragm. If we're looking at, say, the collector now, if we're looking at the diaphragm there, again, we're looking at this nailing. The nailing of the diaphragm to the collector is not 
subject to the 25% increase. That is not what the issue is. The issue is going to be is if the collector is not a glue lamp, but what if it's a steel wide flange and I have a nailer there. So now the nailer bolting to the steel has to be subject to this 25% more shear for the irregularities. Again, the diaphragm nailing at the top is not subject to it. This is coming out of uh, ASC 7, section 12334. Uh, and the second part, we just looked at item one there. The second part, item two, talks about this 25% occurring for collectors and their connections. So now I have to design the collector for 25% more load and their connections. But there's an exception here, and that is if you're using the omega value, omega times Q sub E. And that's much more likely, that's probably what you're using, is these collectors are all designed for and governed by omega times Q sub E for the strength based, or the um, subject to overstrength factor. And so that second factor, that number two, doesn't usually apply. We usually have forces that are governed with the omega factor, and since the exception will, will prevent that from being an issue. So now let's move past collectors and irregularities. Uh, let's look at diaphragm deflection. And this is an issue that really, in my opinion, the standard of practice is still not quite up to where the code is. Most engineers are not checking diaphragm deflections unless they're at property lines or if they are adjacent to buildings where they might be pounding against each other. Um, I often find that the plan checker is asking the question uh, and the engineer is responding to the question. But the code does have and has had for a long time provisions about checking diaphragm deflection. So let's talk about diaphragm deflection and how to calculate it. And the calculation methods I'm going to talk about in the 2008 um, special design provisions for wind and seismic for wood structures that the NDS is tied to. And we'll then also talk about the deflection limits that uh, you may need to check. If it comes to the diaphragm deflection, there's really a three-part equation here. If you go to the commentary, it's actually in four parts if you're really looking at trying to split it into uh, the different contributing factors. But the easiest way of approaching it is this three-part equation that is equation 4.2-1. And it has a bending element, and it has a shear element, and it has a cord slip element. Now the bending element is this, this front element that um, is based on simply the cords. And all the factors you see down below, they're dealing with the size of the diaphragm, the area of the cords, what your shear is, what your modular elasticity, the uh, apparent shear stiffness, which has embedded in it the modulus of shear, the shear modulus for the plywood or OSB. Cord slip, if it's bolted. I mean, there's a lot into this equation that can be used. And if we're looking at that, that first bending part that you see circled, it's all derived from this equation for uniform loaded beam, 5 WL to the fourth over 384 EI. It all is exactly based on this. And if we simply take a look at a uni uniformly loaded beam and we look at it, how it's bending, it's bending in a flexural manner, the derivation of this equation is simply taking the uh, 5 WL to the fourth over 384 EI and substituting in it of uh, units that are more consistent, we want to use L in feet, and we want to use um, uh, the shear load in pounds per linear, or the applied load in pounds per foot, and we can simply work our units out to come up with this portion, this 45 WL to the 44 over 2 EI, and recognizing our reaction is WL over 2, which is the same as the unit shear V times the width of the diaphragm. So I'm simply going to make that substitution. So that means my W will be 2VB over L. And now I'll substitute everything in, and I get my delta associated with bending can be reduced to this. But I don't like that E and I. I mean, I, how do I find I of the chords? You know, I'll use the parallel axis theorem. So I can go ahead and solve now what my I is going to be and simply come up with a much simpler equation where I'm going to replace I in terms of the area of my cords times the width of my diaphragm. 
and I have these summations. This is my parallel axis theorem for a moment of inertia about uh, something whose axis is not on the neutral axis, and recognize that um, D is negligible in the terms of, uh, or, or uh, where D over equals B over 2, and I sub X is negligible, I should say. I sub X is negligible. Everything is going to be dominated by D. Simply plug that in for I, I'll get a new equation for I, and then I'll get my new bending equation. And so those that look at that equation and try to figure out well, where this 5VL cubed over 8EAB come from, it's simply a direct derivation of our traditional bending equation. So that's no mystery there. And it matches the code equation, so I'm, I'm happy as a clam to see that. Now if we look at our second part, which is going to be the shear nail uh, and slip, this is the shear deformation and the nail slip portion of the equation. What's happening here is we're looking at the deformed shape consists of parallelograms. This is shear deformation as opposed to flexural deformation. And we don't usually worry about shear deformation when our beams are relatively small in depth, but in this we have a significant amount. And plus the nail slip is where a lot of the deformation is occurring. And our nail slip <coughs> equation has this uh, G sub A, an apparent shear modulus, that we combine the shear deformation of the plywood or OSB with the nail slip that's going to be occurring. And that apparent shear stiffness is in kips per inch, and those values are actually in the code. And uh, the tables provide those values for you. And those, are, uh, those values are assumed to occur at design value of the shear. If you want something more accurate than that, at shears that are lower than the design basis, you can use the commentary equations and get a little bit more accurate, uh, or a little bit more, uh, I don't know if it's going to be more accurate, but <laughs> it'll allow you to actually modify the equation a little bit differently or put in different values for the actual nails that you might be using. These values are empirically derived from the tests um, that were done by, um, in, in conjunction with the development of the code. So we're back now looking at the last piece here is the cord slip. And this is if I have a cord that's not welded and not you know, uh, continuous, but if it's bolted. I have to worry about how much slip there might occur in each connection. And if I have a connection where I am worrying about slip occurring, such as a wood bolted member, I may find that I have too much motion occurring in this connection. And so I would worry about this delta sub C, this amount for each connection. And then I would simply sum up all the tension and compression cord slips together to come up with that value. And um, sometimes you consider the slip only in tension. I mean, what if you have a concrete wall and you're only worried about tension cracks or masonry wall, and so you might worry about the masonry cracking open because it's not able to take tension, but my, if I have a steel ledger that's bolted or something of that nature, I'm, I might have something, uh, some other issue to worry about. So I'll give you a little illustration here if hopefully um, the computer's fast enough to see this, but if I have these gaps here, essentially a cord slip connection by delta C, and if I all of a sudden deform it, the gaps close at one end and open wider at the other, creating my deformation. So I would have then this type of deformations purely by the cord slip occurring. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. And so I add all these, these three elements together, the three elements of bending, shear deformation, and cord, and I come up with an elastic deformation. This is what it would behave assuming elastic, because this is based on the fact that, you know, we divide by our response modification factor, R. I mean, we divide by four. Remember our building for a intermediate precast building divided by four for a special concrete shear wall building, it's five, and that's an elastic. We want to see what our maximum deformation is, delta sub m. So we have to multiply by c sub d and divide by, if we had a importance factor, we'll divide by our importance factor to come up with what our maximum deformation is. And that's where our limits are. There's certain limits in the code that we have that have to be considered. And one of them is we worry about the impact to adjacent sp um, structures. We don't want to have a building next door get hit. We worry also about then creating a setback from property lines. And if 
we have a, a building that crosses the property line, then we may actually harm uh, that adjacent building. And we want to maintain structural integrity. We want the building moving so much that the structural integrity is harmed within the building itself. And this language of, that's in the code has been in the code for a long time, and it's moved itself around between the Uniform Building Code into um, the uh, special design provisions for wind and seismic and ASE 7. It basically says permissible deflection shall be that deflection that will permit the diaphragm and any attached elements to maintain their structural integrity and continue to support those prescribed loads as determined by the applicable building code and standard. Very vague. I mean, it, it leaves it up to engineering judgment. One of the last bastions of engineering judgment left in the code, I must say. So that gets then to deformation compatibility is what is this issue that we worry about that if we have something that's compatible or not. And we'll give an example, these reentrant corners. If we have deformation com compatibility, let's look at an example with reentrant corners. And if we have a, a deep reentrant corner, and here's a collector, but it's going to deform like this. This is how our diaphragms will deform. But there's some engineers that say, well, you know, I'm not going to design that as a shear wall. I don't need the collector. I'm going to ignore it. Then I can just go ahead and span my diaphragm from one extreme to the other. And so I will then have a deflected shape that's going to ignore that reentrant corner and go right past it. But the problem is, is that without a reentrant corner, or without a collector here, or the shear wall, acting, then I've got the roof structure that wants to tear because the deflected shape of the diaphragm is not compatible with my stiffness of my reentrant corner. So that's going to be a problem. Well, I don't know, how, how often does this ever happen? I mean, does, have we ever seen something like this happen? Yes, we've seen this happen. And this is exactly what we have here on this K-mark that happened in Lander's earthquake was the reentrant corner was ignored, no collector was placed involved, and so we had a localized collapse of the roof structure. And this is a blatant example of where the problem occurred, but it can occur on smaller reentrant corners as well. Just a small stiffening reentrant corner is going to have a significant amount of stiffening effect. And so in this instance here, here's a small little reentrant corner and you may start crying foul, how am I going to design that as a shear wall? It will never work as a shear wall. I know, it becomes a, becomes a problem for these short reentrant corners. We still need a strut there. This is not a collector. This is a strut. If that was a shear wall, this would be a collector. But if I'm just simply going to tie it in to hopefully provide some sort of tie so that I don't tear my building away from the reentrant corner, then it becomes a strut. And this is, this is what I'm happening here, is I'm actually causing it to maybe rock. And if I can actually control the rocking here, then that might actually help me. Or if I can actually tie it in for the strength of the reentrant corner. Maybe the reentrant corner fails in bending or shears itself loose, but we don't want to lose the gravity system of the building. We don't want the building to collapse down. So if I can tie it into this reentrant corner and let it rock, then I've really done myself a, a real favor in a large earthquake without the building tearing and then getting a partial collapse. So you need to design conservatively that strut for the rocking force of the wall and any additional restraint forces that might be there. And that might be problematic, especially with architects trying to make these buildings look less boxy, you know, by putting in relief. And it can become a problem for reentrant corners that are, you know, five, six feet. So that's deformation compatibility. Let's look at another issue with deformation compatibility, and that is the hinging of the wall base that might be out of plane. If we look at a diaphragm that's going to be deflecting a lock, well, those walls want to rotate. So if we look at a rotating wall and we may be concerned about the base rotating, we've got a problem, at, especially if we have a pilaster down at the bottom, we have a problem with those pilasters potentially wanting to spall. This is from the 2014 Napa earthquake. The pilaster restraint against rotation, these are the damages you start to see by that restraint. And, uh, you know, these are types of things we like to see as engineers to find out how the behavior of these buildings occur. What is that, com that deformation compatibility actually involving? Now, if we develop a plastic hinge at the bottom, maybe it's not necessarily a problem. Maybe it's still permissible. Maybe it's still going to you know, create a plastic hinge, but I haven't created a mechanism yet. 
So it could still be considered to be permissible if, if it's still able to carry the vertical load by what you see there. And that's going to then bring us to our last polling uh, question, I believe, which uh, I'll turn over to Marcy. All right, here we go. Diaphragm deflection should be considered to A, determine if system will continue to support its loads, or B, avoid impact with adjacent structures, or C, maintain structural integrity, D, avoid crossing property lines, or E, all of the above. All right, so about 40, 50% have voted. A few more seconds. All right, about 10 more seconds, waiting for about 10 more, 10% 10 more of you to vote. All right, and I'm going to close the poll and sharing the poll. All right, wow, 93% of you voted all of the above and just a few percent have voted the other ways. All right, so I'm hoping that the answer, John, is all of the above. Let's see. Go for it, John. Well, yep, it is all above, which is great because I was worried, you know, half of you would be asleep by now going through this long <laughs> and that you would be clamoring at the last minute trying to remember what was the right answer, but you're correct. It's all of the above that we need to make sure the diaphragm deflections are addressed to determine whether it's able to continue to support its load through uh, deformation compatibility, whether we're going to impact adjacent structures, which can be a real problem if you have seismic joints within a structure, and maintain structural integrity within the structure and avoid crossing property lines. So it is definitely all of the above. So I congratulate you all for, uh, or most of you, getting the right answer. And this uh, brings us to uh, really the end. I just want to give some closing comments then as we go. and. I want to uh, just sort of bring back a little bit what we talked about, that the building code provisions that were in the code uh, are a reaction to past events. And it's always important to consider that, that we learn a lot from these earthquakes. And the current wall anchorage design um, hopefully has solved these code inadequacies. But they haven't been tested by an earthquake yet, a design level earthquake, the current provisions. I mean, you saw in that graph, that bar graph I gave you with the timeline, it's been a long time since we've had a design level earthquake check these provisions. There's plenty of old inventory out there. The failures will continue to occur until the older buildings are retrofitted and demolished. And um, that's just part of, um, I guess, cost economics that we are currently looking at in today's society. Also, I want to let you know that the 2015 special design provisions for wind and seismic is available as a free download currently. Um, it's not, I don't believe it's in print form, but it's uh, nearly there. Um, but you can see what's going to be coming down through ASCE 7-16 when it gets adopted by your local jurisdiction. So you might want to check that out, and it is available free from uh, AWC. And what I would like to do then is uh, conclude the course and open it up to questions. And Buddy, if you have anything to add, go ahead. Okay, John, thanks. Uh, very well done. And we do have a few questions that rolled in and probably have a few more as we get started here. But talk a little bit about pneumatic nails. Uh, a lot of those end up having a smaller diameter than nails that are specified in the NDS. Um, are there any concerns about that from a design standpoint? Are there some other resources for designers using pneumatic nails? All right. Well, the pneumatic nails and... Uh, I would assume you mean uh, the typical gun nails that are used with an air compressor that are still driving the nails in a magazine format. And they are typically, um, oftentimes they're sinker nails in a sense, uh, and that diameter that, for instance, if you specify a 10-penny uh, common nail, which should be 0.148, you'll get sometimes the pneumatic nail, you get something smaller. But it, it, it really isn't necessary. In fact, um, a lot of those that are used to nailing out here in the West Coast are using full-size, full-diameter nails in their guns, and they're, they're shooting full-size .148. Now, some of them are ordering 16-penny sinker gun nails that are 
um, two and a quarter or two and eighth inches long to get the exact embedment and through the and so they're depending on how they're ordering them and this is why the NDS really is preferring you to specify the diameter to eliminate all confusion that if you're going to specify a 10 penny common nail it it's helpful to indicate right next to that specification that you're talking about 0 0.148 inch diameter so that it, it, it eliminates the confusion. Uh, the old joke is what's so common about a common nail when it's hard to find? Um, and it's, it, it, it really isn't hard to find unless if you're specifying the diameter and, and, let the, and make sure that the diameter and the framer is aware of what's coming in. If, if you're throwing your hands up in the air and you're saying, you know, these guys are just going to nail with what they want to nail and I can't police it, there are ways of reducing the value. Um, there's, um, there is a publication, it's an ICC report that talks about diaphragm values with different nails. Also uh, the APA publication uh, 138, their technical publication on diaphragms, gives some background about how the diaphragm values in the code were originally determined and you can actually use those provisions to sort of come up with a modified provision with smaller nails. But I caution you to do that because the provisions in the code are all based on test values and if you stray too far from that you may be into an area that is not necessarily um, compatible with the test results and the factors of safety that are built into them. Thanks John. Uh, next question has to do with um, those continuity ties across the entire building. Um, question is doesn't the wall anchorage force get transferred via the diaphragm to the shear walls in the direction under uh, consideration. So maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, diaphragm aspect ratios and, and how that affects the, the need for those continuity ties. Okay. Um, I, if, if I don't, if, but if you think I'm not answering the question, let me know. But um, sub-diaphragms and diaphragms will overlap. And our subdiaphragm is taking the load into the main diaphragm, and then the main diaphragm is judged on its own merits, such as for a blocked wood diaphragm, the aspect ratio is four to one instead of two and a half to one. So it's going to be evaluated differently. Also realize that the main diaphragm is not only taking the wall force, but at a, at a different uh, seismic coefficient, but it's also taking its self weight. So it's completely a different design. When, when we take the wall anchorage force and we take it into the diaphragm, we're not taking that wall anchorage force any further than the continuity ties. Once it's in the continuity ties and we assume it's distributed into the diaphragm, we don't then take that wall anchorage force and then transfer it into the main diaphragm and design the main diaphragm. That's, that's a considered to be the whole system of the building that is being designed, not a portion of the building. So they're being designed for two different uh, seismic coefficients, two different equations, as it were, and one of the one of the oddities of this approach is the subdiaphragm and the main diaphragm overlap. Yet we're not adding their shears together. So when you think about it, at the wall, the subdiaphragm has a unit shear associated with the wall anchorage, and the main diaphragm has a unit shear associated with the entire building. Yet we don't combine the two together. The, the loads are treated separately. They have their own separate seismic design coefficients, and they're treated as such. Okay, thanks. Um, what about openings and roof diaphragms? Is there any kind of methodology for uh, design of large openings? Yes, um, there is a publication out there that was done, and I, for the life of me, don't know it off the top of my head, but it was done under maybe three, four years ago that talked about um, diaphragms with large openings and how to deal with those. Smaller ones such as skylights and smoke vents that typically occur in these panelized roof systems are manageable. What you would do is you would simply look at that discontinuity, and it's creating sort of a reduced shear value, of course or in a shear value, a increased shear value, unit shear value, because you have reduced the amount of diaphragm capable of, re of resisting that shear. So you'll have elevated shears where the openings are, but you also get some localized bending effects. 
And I didn't really get into that, but you do get localized bending effects that require some strapping or at least some uh, some engineering judgment as far as the size of that bending and whether that bending can be accommodated on a localized level between the openings. So you would have to worry about sort of little cords and little bending elements if you have a perforated diaphragm in the roof. And that's a much larger subject um, that I uh, don't have time to get into. But there are resources out there that talk about how to deal with that. That's great. And you answered another question about some additional resources besides the building code and the wind and seismic standard, John. Um, talk a little bit about construction adhesives between the sheathing and the framing and whether that's ever considered uh, acceptable for, for lateral loads and seismic uh, applications. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm the foremost authority on that. I do not use structural adhesives for any shear, and I believe you're not permitted to use adhesives between um, sheathing and wood framing for seismic reasons. Uh, the only place I'm uh, that I believe you're allowed to use that for, which would be for composite sections where you're looking at gravity loads. and for that, I believe it may only be for stiffness. If you look, for instance, many of the eye joist manufacturers will use adhesives to reduce the um, deflection of their floor systems to get underneath the deflection requ uh, requirement. But I have not seen uh, it used for uh, life safety issues for uh, seismic. And But you might know better than I do. Traffic continuously across. Um, yeah, John, we, we would agree that it shouldn't be used for diaphragm applications. I think there's a provision in the wind seismic standard that allows it for shear wall design, but uh, we would not recommend it at all for, for diaphragm, diaphragm uh, design. Um, let's see here. This one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, in a sub diaphragm, what is a typical connection of a sub purlin to a sub diaphragm cord, John? All right. Um, well, recognize that in a sub diaphragm, your maximum anchorage force on that sub purlin is at the wall. And so as the load comes from the wall through the connection into that first purlin, that's your entire wall anchorage force. And then as it works its way across the subdiaphragm to the cord at the far side, that axial load, can, you can actually justify the axial load is becoming less and less and less because it's being distributed up into the subdiaphragm. And so by the time you reach that cord, it technically should have zero axial force in it, and you're just going to have a nominal vertical hanger for the gravity load. Great. John, uh, very well done. Uh, it's about all the time we've got left for questions. I'm going to ask Marcy to uh, come back in if you can uh, advance to some of those last uh, slides for her. And uh, Marcy, take it away and close us out for the day. <laughs>